Great. Okay. Hello, uh, good evening uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Carey and it's a, a pleasure to welcome you to the uh, second of our uh, winter webinar series. Uh, you can tell it's, web it's winter in the, uh, the north of England. Here I am wearing my, uh, my jersey this evening. Um, our uh, series are brought in conjunction with our sponsor, uh, Olympus. And uh, this evening is a, or the first of our um, Skull Base uh, webinars. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a session where we've got some uh, really interesting uh, case presentations on uh, asthenia, asthesia neuroblastoma. Um, I'm uh, going to remind uh, our attendees that uh, we don't use the chat function. Uh, so uh, try not to, uh, to, to engage with that. What we want you to use is the Q&A function. So uh, please write down your questions and we can uh, answer these as we go uh, along. Uh, we'll have a uh, question session at the uh, end of uh, uh, each of the, uh, the case presentations. Uh, so I'm, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to uh, my colleague, Assam Alabid from the University of Barcelona, uh, to uh, introduce his uh, faculty uh, this evening. So, uh, Sam, thanks for organizing this and over to you. Thank you very much, Finn. Thanks for the IRS for this opportunity to take care from webinar about uh, esthesio neuroblastoma. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Laura Oriaga from the Department of uh, Radiology of our hospital from Barcelona, as well as Dr. Uh, Ricardo Carrao, professor from ENT department of uh, Ohio State uh, University, US, and Professor Roy Cassiano from ENT department from Miami, US. So it's a pleasure to have you with us and to discuss about uh, three, four cases, depends on the time we have, and take questions from uh, audience. So to go to that directly to the cases, I present the first case of a female of 38 years with episodes of epistaxis, nasal obstruction, hyposmia. We did the biopsy and we have low grade two of stationoroblastoma. So, let Dr. Uh, Oriaga explain the radiological finding we have in, in these cases. Professor Oriaga? We, we can't hear you. Mute. Yeah. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay. so this is uh, the first case. And on this uh, MRI images, on the sagittal uh, T1 weighted image, uh, we can see a hypo-intense uh, soft tissue mass with a high-density fluid in the sphenoid sinus. And this soft tissue mass is um, uh, involving the ethmoid uh, cells. And is here is uh, a good in the medial wall of uh, the orbit, but on the coronal images we can see that the, the lesion doesn't trespass the border of uh, of the orbit. We can see correctly the muscles and the fat in the in the orbit. And here we can see the anterior skull base. There is an interruption of uh, the low signal intensity of uh, the skull base as seen on this T1 weighted uh, image. And on the T2-weighted uh, image, we can see that the lesion has some intermediate signal intensity with some um, areas of uh, cyst some cystic changes with high signal intensity. And on the coronal T2-weighted image, again, here we cannot uh, see the um, uh, low signal intensity of the peri periosteum of uh, the skull base. And there is um, not uh, um, there is a continuity between the mass and also the olfactory bulbs over uh, here. And again, 
we can see the high signal intensity of uh, the fluid in the sphenoid uh, sinus. On uh, T1 uh, weighted uh, image, we can see the enhancement of uh, the lesion and the contact of uh, the neoplasm with the anterior uh, fossa, anterior cranial uh, fossa. And again, we can see here the enhancement of the mass with these cystic uh, areas that uh, were well depicted on the T2-weighted uh, images. And on the coronal image, we can see the enhancement of uh, the dura. So um, when tumors uh, grow, in the, um, they can uh, invade the, the bone and the cribriform plate. And uh, this can be seen as an interruption of uh, the bone, as we can see in this uh, case. And uh, the dura can be, in some cases, uh, thickened. But this can be due secondary to inflammatory changes or vascular changes. And when the dura is invaded, there is more nodular enhancement more than five millimeters in thickness. And PL enhancement can be also seen. In this case, we only see some dural, nodular, irregular enhancement. And another criteria for dural invasion is the loss of um, the high point intensity uh, band of, uh, the, between the tumor and the overlying enhancing dura corresponding to the uh, periosteal, bony periosteal uh, layer. So in this case, on uh, the MR images, there is uh, invasion of uh, the anterior skull base and invasion of, of uh, the dura. And uh, here we can see some uh, diffusion weighted uh, images with the corresponding ADC uh, map. Diffusion weighted images provide important quantitative uh, assessment that can um, increase uh, the clinical and uh, morphological data, the confidence in differentiating between benign and malignant masses. In general, malignant masses tend to have lower ADC values compared to benign lesions, but there is an overlap between uh, malignant and benign lesions. And in this case, the mass depicts an intermediate signal intensity on diffusion weighted images, but not decrease ADC map. So here there is there are no really a data that to say on the diffusion images that this is a very cellular mass. And we have seen on the T2 weighted images that it has an intermediate signal intensity with cystic uh, changes. So let's start with Rick. Do you need more tools to do your diagnosis? We have biopsy, MRI. Do you miss something more? Micro, please. To complete the staging, I think that we have to look at the neck and we have to look at the very, uh, at the very least at the chest. Uh, here, uh, I usually just do a, a PET CT and look at the, the entire body for possible metastasis. But I think that a chest CT and, and, um, and a CT of the neck uh, would be sufficient. And uh, once that is completed, I don't think I would need anything more. Roy, do you add something more? Uh, I think our, our protocol is basically for these type of patients is a PET CT. We don't necessarily do anything else unless something, you know, shows on PET CT. Um, but at least we do that. Shane, Michael, very similar. Um, I suppose the only other thing would be a high resolution CT sinuses, including orbits. Mm -hmm. So what next? You have PET scan, there is no metastasis. Neck, negative neck. And you only have this mass with the biopsy of positive for stationaroblastoma, low grade. Chen, what is your opinion about the treatment? Yeah, so the 
you, you've given us a really good history. Um, clearly, you know, we'd, uh, you've, got, you've, you've examined it, you've taken your biopsy, you're happy that your pathologist knows what he's talking about. Uh, if there's any doubt about it, you'd want to get it sent off for, um, for a second opinion. But looking at the, uh, the imaging that you presented us here, uh, this is the, the, the sort of uh, disease that, that we quite like to see because it's relatively uh, limited. Um, so many times you see these and they've, uh, they've expanded intracranially to, to a much greater extent. So looking at the, um, the orbits, looking at the uh, intracranial cavity, looking at the brain, um, this looks like it would be a nice procedure to think about doing endoscopically. Dr. Cassiano? Three. This is a perfect case for um, wide resection, standard anterior skull base resection. I tend to do it endoscopically, but obviously the options are to do it in a more traditional way if you can't. Um, and, and resect this whole thing. This patient should do quite well. Same here. I agree. Uh, we would do it endoscopic, but if you choose a cranial endoscopic or a transcranial approach, it, I think that will be just the same. So in this case, you... Sorry. We have this tumor. We remove the tumor. We have the skull base uh, defect. And how do you plan to reconstruct the defect, Dr. Karab? So my, they, my preferred method would be to use fascia lata and use a, a pericranial flap uh, that is placed transfrontal. Um, in some cases, we do not use a pericranial flap. We just go with the fascia lata in multiple layers, uh, similar what, to what the, the Italian group has um, presented before. So we, we have a, an epi, a, a subdural uh, graft uh, followed by an epidural graft and maybe a third one on the bottom. Uh, if I'm going to use a pericranial flap, then I do the first two, an epidural and and, and uh, and a subdural graft, and I put the pericranium as an overlay. Uh, and the reason to use the pericranium is only that it mucosalizes much faster. Uh, no, no other reason for it. I think that from the reconstructive standpoint, uh, just the fascia lata is fine, but when I use the pericranium, it, it heals much faster. Cassiano? Yeah, I mean, my, my technique is well known and goes back 20 some years already. But uh, although originally I used uh, freeze dried Dura because of the availability of a tissue bank at our campus, uh, over the years it went to using uh, uh, basically a cellular matrix type of uh, commercially available graphs, the most common one being uh, Alloderm, which we stay. Uh, we use the one millimeter medium thickness. We uh, use the hammock technique that's well described in the literature as a one layer in, inlay outlay combination type, type procedure. And then if there's any, the one thing that has changed for the last four or five years in, my, in our practice is that there's also a septal flap available or an extended septal flap, we just rotate it over to, and, and of course the margins need to be negative because we have to check the margins that they're not involved with tumor. You could do, you could use bilateral flaps, uh, preserving a caudal and, and dorsal strut to support the nose. And you can basically take the whole thing off. And, uh, and I use that not for the watertight closure because that's done by the alloderm technique. Uh, it's basically just to place it in the hammock, the part that's in the center that takes the longest to heal and granulate and causes some prolonged crusting. Uh, we put it in that area so it heals a lot quicker and less crusting. Uh, and they proceed with obviously post-op radiation within five, six weeks uh, of surgery. Shane? Micro, please. Yeah, fever, um, fascia lata. 
um, uh, two layers of fascia lata. And then I, I, again, I was looking at that uh, nasal cavity on the left hand side, um, you know, eyeballing that, you know, there may be, uh, as Roy said, the ability to use a flap from that side, take it down onto the floor. Um, but you'd have to look at the, uh, you'd have to look at that really carefully that on that sagittal cut, that posterior end of the tumor is, um, is, is pretty close uh, to uh, your, your pedicle. Um, but so I think we'd probably be fav favoring two or three layers of, uh, of fascia lata. Great. Um, resection is complete, free margin. There is no metastasis. What next? Do you plan chemo, radio, chemo, radio, Jane? I think in, in this case, uh, with grade, grade two, we wouldn't go for chemo, but we would certainly give that run this past our, um, uh, our tumor board again. Uh, and I, I, I suspect we'd be uh, offering the patient radiotherapy. Roy, micro. Micro, Roy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, radiation. Uh, I think this, uh, this is uh, kind of <laughs> criteria for post-operative radiation. Dr. Carao. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, adjuvant radiation. Uh, would this cause the possibility of using proton therapy uh, with these patients, mostly for the protection of the of the eyes and the optics and brain? Um, it is not critical, but it can help. Um, we would, I would radiate at least the upper neck on this patient. Um, and the reason is that even when the high AMS is low, the the cutish or the TNM is high and both a high cutish or, or TNM or a high HAMS correlate with the incidence of, of, um, of metastasis, a delayed metastasis, which have really a dismal prognosis. So we, we tend to radiate these patients, at least again, some one and two. Even in zero NIP? Yes, prophylactic. Prophylactic, okay. Um, I agree, we tend to do the same thing. We would irradiate the neck. Uh, I mean, they're there already getting the therapy and, and for the reasons Rick stated, uh, you know, you extend the, the coverage to those areas of likely metastases. And, and just like Roy uh, mentioned, we, we do it, we try to do it within a, a window of five to six weeks, basically with, between four and six would be fine. Uh, some patients get a little bit delayed, but not by much. Uh, sooner than that, it's, it's not practical. The patients are still healing and, and you're still observing them in the clinic. Uh, so that period between four to six weeks seems to be kind of the, of the happy balance. Great, so the procedure is surgery, radiotherapy for tumor or for superior neck. So, uh, Isan, there were a couple of questions in the audience. One, one was the timeline of the radiation, which we just addressed. Yeah, exactly. the, one, the, the use of immunohistochemistry. Uh, so, the, this this uh, this tumor, the the, cyst, the olfactor neuroblastoma, is part of this small round blue cell tumors, and it has neuroendocrine differentiation. So, the immunohistochemistry is actually key in these patients. It's impossible to see uh, what type of tumor this is by normal uh, normal stains. Um, and we, we tend to think about the immunohistochemistry as something that is objective, but it's really not. It requires a very experienced pathologist to, to do all the array of tests that need to be done and to really interpret the test in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Uh, it's not a, a black or the, every immunohistochemistry it's not a black or white, it, it tends, it's a range. So again, it requires a very, very experienced pathologist to help you to, to obtain the right diagnosis. To, to, to close with this, uh, this case, there is another question, only one minute. What about lumbar drain? Do you use it? Yes or not? Shane? No. 
right? I don't use lumbar drain. I see another quick question that you'll address later comes up. Do you manage the orbit? I would take the lamina on the side of the, uh, on the ipsilateral side of the uh, lesion, but that's only for a permanent section, but I wouldn't do anything beyond the, the lamina propitia. And no lumbar drain. We don't routinely use lumbar drain for any repair of skull base, unless it's a high flow leak posteriorly in a posterior fossa. See? No. See? Same. Same as Roy. Uh, we don't use the lumbar drain. Uh, and uh, in the lamina papyrusia, it depends. Uh, so the tumor in the x ray, it seems to be the tumor seems to be about in the lamina papyrusia. If that would be the case, I definitely would take it, just like Roy mentioned. Uh, sometimes, though, what we find is that there's actual mucosa in between the tumor and the lamina of apparitia that has been pushed uh, laterally, and uh, you cannot really see it very well in the x-rays. If that would be the case, I don't, take, I don't even take the lamina. But if the tumor is, is on the lamina, that's, I do exactly like Roy mentioned. Great. Let's move to next case. This is female, 46 year old. Due to paresthesia, they did a radiological finding. This, this uh, patient is asymptomatic. There is no sinonasal symptoms. And we find tumor and we did the biopsy and we have a high grade stationary plastoma. So I, Dr. Oriaga will take care about radiological finding. Professor Oriaga. Mm -hmm. So I have to share again the... Okay. Okay, so this is the next case. And in this case, again, we can see a soft tissue mass in the Edmoid um, cells on the right side. This is an intermediate signal intensity on T1 weighted uh, images, an intermediate signal intensity on T2 weighted images. The mass is uh, extending or is uh, agutting the medial. Uh, wall of uh, the orbit, but there is a fat plane and we can see the fat plane in the orbit separating the muscle from uh, the, um, the, the lesion. The lamina papyrusia is not involved. It's um, uh, protruding, but it's not uh, destroyed. And again, here we can see the muscle, the fat plane and the mass that uh, it has a, 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 a stands to the lamina papyrusia, but it doesn't uh, across uh, the lamina papyrusia. And again, we can see the fat plane between the muscles and the, and the tumor. And here on uh, the sagittal T1 weighted image, we can, the bone defect, we can see the low signal intensity of uh, the bone in the skull base. And if uh, in this uh, zoom uh, image, in the anterior part, there's interruption of uh, this, uh, the bone of uh, the anterior skull uh, base. And on the coronal uh, T1 with the image with contrast, we can see the extension of uh, the tumor to the anterior cranial fossa and also the enhancement, nodular enhancement of uh, the dura. That means that there is invasion of uh, the dura and intracranial extension of uh, the tumor. And, and this is uh, the, the case, uh, this case. So these are the imaging findings on uh, this case. So, Rick, do we need more bits? I, I, lost, I lost your communication there for a second. Yeah. The, do you need more tools for diagnosis? I'll, I'll keep consistent, the same as the other case. So he, you can go with us. 
CT neck or CT chest or with a PET CT. Right. And as I mentioned before, I prefer the, the PET CT if we have it available. In this case, you see that it crossed the midline and go to the left side. Do you remove both uh, olfactory valve? I do. And so for me to do a, a unit, let, let's put it the, the, the opposite way. For me to do the unilateral resection, the tumor has to be only in one side and I cannot be invading the septum or it cannot be invading the, the olfactory bulb. And the reason is that you have uh, you have fibers, olfactory fibers, that cross from one side of the septum to the other side. So we have found that um, that they they just have they they cross, and uh, the same at the olfactory bulb in the intracranial part. So what that means is that you have a tumor that has a tendency for for perineural invasion. Uh, so if you have this type of of situation it would not be completely safe to try to preserve it. So every time that the tumor is invading the septum or crossing to the other side, whether it's intranasal or intracranial, I would take out both sides. Dr. Cassiano? I agree with Rick. This, this is almost an identical case, the last one, and a little bit more intracranial invasion. You can actually, you both cross the midline, as Rick said. Um, I have a very, uh, very short sensitivity for doing a complete bilateral anterior skull base resection, as Rick stated as well. Um, I do do hemi anterior skull base endoscopically, uh, but, I, it, it, but I'm very, very picky on which aesthesials I would do that for uh, because of the cross, cross uh, infiltration through the olfactory nerves. It can also go like in this case, intracranially and cross around the falcs, around the back of the crystagalli. It could also go uh, and expand that interface where the olfactory nerves cross over between the crystagalli and the upper uh, perpendicular plate. So I'm very critical of those areas on MRI and I really study that and I wanna look at that and I wanna see a very normal olfactory cleft on the left side with no soft tissue. I wanna see air there. So um, unfortunately, the first thesios, those are far and few in between. Jane, any more comments about bilateral and unilateral? Oh, I was just going to comment, and it's a, it's a bit unusual to have a grade four tumor presenting like this. Uh, so often they're much later. Uh, and you said it was an incidental finding. How old was she, and, and where did she have the paresthesia? I think she, she had paresthesia in the, in the right side. So it was just an incidental finding. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, she's, it's unusual, as I say, for something to find yeah. something quite so small as this. I mean, that, the other thing, with it being such a, um, a uh, histologically aggressive tumor, she could also be counseled for chemoradiotherapy. Before, Sarge? But that would not, that wouldn't be my, you know, that would be in the, that would be a treatment option, but it wouldn't be the first treatment option. You, you, something this sort of size and the extent, you, again, like the last case, I would favor uh, surgical resection, again, endonasally as our, as our first option. So some question from audience. If this uh, high grade uh, stationeroblastoma, do you plan to do chemo as in induction, then do surgery or chemo radiation, then repeat the MRI and repeat scan and uh, do surgery? I wouldn't, not for anesthesia. I think we've reserved that for more of the high grade, poorly undifferentiated type of uh, carcino squamous cell carcinomas. In fact, we are participating in a couple of uh, national studies looking at that or a higher, you know, higher stage type uh, skull base or orbital invasion type uh -huh. hormones, but not esthesios. Um, that hasn't been our routine. It's been, if you can resect it, we resect it with margins and then give them radiation post-op. Dr. Carrao, do you do a- yeah, I, would, 
I would use a chemo in, in one of two instances for this particular case uh, or for a physio. Uh, one, the patient refuses surgery uh, and you have an advanced uh, HIEMS like this, I would give them induction chemo to see if whether or not they respond. And, and of course, if they refuse the surgery and they respond, then as Sean mentioned, uh, chemo radiation would be a second second alternative. I agree that surgery is the best alternative, but it would be second best. Uh, the other instance that I use it is if you have a lot of intracranial extension, which is not the case in this in this particular patient, but if you have a lot of brain displacement or orbital displacement, I may use chemo first to try to reduce that type of uh, of um, of compromise, and that way. Uh, you have less morbidity in the in in the this area. It's, it just becomes a little bit easier to resect, and you don't have to manipulate the brain as much. Uh, but in this particular case, no, I would not use it. Okay, there is another question. If you find the lacrimal sac involved with the tumor, mm, do you do a combined surgeon? or you remove it in the scope too? If it is not, I don't see that, I don't see that happening in here, but if I see that, I would question that we're really dealing with esthesio. I would really go back and look at that pathology one more time and ask for a second and third opinion because that would be highly atypical. So the question is not really what approach, but it's really, are we doing the, do we have the right diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Rick. I, I think on the sagittal, you can see the tumor's leading edge uh, really goes uh, up to the upper perpendicular plate anterior septum area. And that's all resected as part of the Lothrop procedure. And of course, you drill all that bone down uh, in the nasal frontal area. Uh, so that's an additional margin, getting down the nice, healthy white bone. Um, if the nasal bones were involved, that, that would be, I agree with Rick, that would be unusual. Um, you can usually endoscopically resect it from below if you needed to, but that's unlikely to happen that often with esthesio. Also, uh, the lacrimal sac, well, if it's, if it's involved, you can resect um, a good portion of that, if not all of the lacrimal sac. But again, on this case, I don't see that happening um, specifically. Great. Any more comments? You, you already as well the upper neck in this case? Yeah, with the high arms four, I would radiate basically the entire neck. Entire neck. Agreed. Yeah. Great. Let's move to the third case. This is female, 58. Episodes of epistaxis, hyposmia, low grade. And we have these images in radiology. Professor Riaga. So this is the next case, and this is a non in city. Mm, with uh, some images with a uh, bone window and uh, these uh, imi uh, images we can see um, soft tissue mass that is occupying the uh, the nasal fossa and the anterior ethmoid cells. We can see that the laminar piracea is uh, preserved and um, there is no extension to the orbit. We can see the fat here uh, between the uh, laminar piracea and uh, the muscles. And on the MR uh, images, again, we can see the, the lesion. It's a well-defined lesion with an intermediate signal uh, intensity. And here we can see the bone plate in the anterior skull uh, base. So there is no extension or destruction of uh, the skull base or extension to the intracranially. And here on this um, uh, T1 weighted uh, with uh, fat saturation, we can see uh, with a um, uh, flare sequence, we can see the lesion, it's a well-defined lesion with uh, high signal intensity, homogeneous. Again, the lamina uh, papyracia, 
but uh, there is no destruction of the lamina papyracea and the fat in the in the intraconal and extraconal fat. And on the situated uh, image, we can see that the lesion has some heterogeneous areas with some areas of intermediate signal intensity and other areas with high signal uh, intensity. And on the coronal plane, we can see the um, skull base, we can see the subarachnoid space and the uh, olfactory bulbs over here. Both olfactory bulbs are very well depicted on this image. And we can see the subarachnoid uh, space and also the bone uh, over here in the anterior skull base, they create from uh, a plate. And the mass, again, well-defined uh, mass. There is no extension to the orbit, no extension to the anterior skull uh, base. And this is another uh, image on uh, the coronal plane. Again, we can see the both olfactory bulbs with uh, the subarachnoid space in uh, and, uh, the cribriform uh, plate over here, preserved clip cribriform uh, plate. And with uh, contrast on gadolinium enhanced uh, images, this is the T1 weighted image without gadolinium. And again, here there is a heterogeneous enhancement. We don't see any enhancement of uh, the dura, and we don't see any extension uh, intracranially or any extension to the uh, to the orbit or any invasion of uh, the orbital um, uh, extracornal uh, fat or the um, orbital um, muscles. So, do you consider this is purely unilateral stesio? It certainly looks that way. Uh, micro. Sorry, I, it looks that way, but I have some questions on both the coronal and the axial plane, uh, particularly to see if there's a little tiny little tongue of tissue that crosses the midline. Um, I don't know if anybody else, or maybe I'm just Professor seeing. Professor Viana. Micro, please. Yeah, I'm going to share again uh, the screen. And uh, it looks like uh, it doesn't cross uh, the midline. Micro, um, Professor Oliana, yeah. micro. So, sorry. Yeah, you're on. You're on. You're okay, on. I'm on. Okay. No. Um, here, maybe yeah. it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, okay. Sorry. I don't think uh, on these images it's crossing the, the midline. Maybe it's um, kind of. Um, there's a mass effect. But uh, there is no uh, really, uh, and the mass is not really crossing the midline. And I, on the these images, these are the diffusion weighted images. In this case, comparing with the other case, uh, the ADC value is uh, lower ADC value, and usually with lower ADC value means that the tumor is more uh, cellular, and usually the, those tumors are. Um, more consistent with uh, uh, malignancy. And here again, um, I don't think uh, that is crossing the midline. You have to take into consideration that also in this area, some um, with MR, there are some um, uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, changes. Uh, the, the magnetic field is, uh, is not homogeneous due to the presence of air and uh, bone. And sometimes we can get some artifacts in this uh, area, some susceptibility artifacts. And uh, on MR, maybe sometimes it's difficult. But also on the on the CT, if uh, we go back to the CT images, on the CT images here, it looks like it's, um, there is a mass effect, but it's not really crossing the midline uh, the tumor. I think in those in these cases. Maybe the city better depicts this uh, uh, the bone limits uh, than the MR because on MR maybe uh, we can have some susceptibility uh, artifacts in the in this uh, area and um, and we have some maybe sometimes difficulties to differentiate what is bone and uh, what is air and I believe uh, that this in this case is not uh, crossing the midline. In the next in the next group where the MRI coronal is, if you can look at that one. So that in the bottom middle, 
bottom this, middle. Here, this. Yeah, right there, that little bit right up high. Here, right this there. area. That's the part that you see. It's it's, yeah. it's very, it looks like that's part of the olfactory apparatus there that's involved. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's crossing at the level of the bulbs there. Okay. I, the, the, uh, I, the bulbs are over here and this is uh, below. So you might be right. Maybe this is, uh, but I consider that this was some uh, like mass effect, but not really crossing the midline. Because in the next uh, image, uh, we can see again the olfactory bulbs and the mass ends uh, in the midline. Now, all the other ones look okay. I'm just curious of that one. Uh, Roy, I can certificate that this is unilateral because <laughs> I did the surgery and there is no invasion to the opposite side. Yeah, so, so I was going to mention is um, that the, the, that question comes very frequently because uh, the, as um, some of the images showed, you cannot differentiate Bowen from invasion. Um, so this is a, something that you have to explore surgically to confirm. Uh, so I agree that this looks like a unilateral case and obviously you're gonna tell us that that's what you did. Uh, but when we do it, when we consider it, I always talk to the patient that they ha well, I'm going to try to do a unilateral, but it may end up in a bilateral. Um, so for the reasons that I alluded before, if I see any, any tumor crossing, I'm going to take it out. Both. Both. Yeah. But this, this case, it, it, again, it looks like a unilateral, but it needs to be confirmed in surgery. Yeah, and for the juniors who are watching, the important thing is that you need to put the telescope in both sides of the nose. So that you, you can see the high on the septum on the left hand side, because if you see disease coming through, then it's clearly bilateral. Uh, it's important not just to go with the images. Yeah, I, and I would go even further than that. Many times you need frozen sections to guide you and make sure to confirm that it's not really invading. That's surgery. So have you got any experience, good experience in all smell preservation after doing unilateral? I mean, it's worth it to do unilateral in tumor like this. You know that it's very aggressive and we must ensure that there is a good margin, free margin of the tumor. Do you go to the limit to do it unilateral or you sacrifice the opposite side in order to get good result for long term? If, if we have the right indications, as we, we both Roy and I mentioned before, and I think Sean con I agreed, I, I, do all, I do my best to try to preserve it. Now, that doesn't mean that the patient is gonna have good olfaction at the end. Uh, at least they're gonna have some olfaction uh, the problem is that it's not just the surgery that, that uh, interferes with the olfactory function, the radiation also will interfere with the olfactory function. So I have had patients that after a unilateral resection, they have 40 out of 40 in the, in the Pennsylvania uh, test. And uh, after radiation, they lose it completely. Um, so uh, unfortunately that's the case, but is it worth it? Absolutely. For the patient it's gonna be absolutely worth it. They, 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 it really is a big component of quality of life. I mean, it's not, the smell, the taste. Um, yeah, I think that if, if you can preserve a little bit of olfaction, it's better than nothing. Uh, but I don't do it at the expense of oncologic margins. Yeah, I agree with Rick. Oncology uh, comes first. Uh, having said that, there there is one published article by the UPenn group, and then there's our own series that we have about 15 patients unpublished. Uh, who did the UPSIT pre and post. Now the techniques were a little different because they tend to resect the upper septum as part of a unilateral case. Whereas we tend to resect only the unilateral mucosa of the septum and then the upper perpendicular plate and even a little and drill down some of the falks uh, or the crystagali and resect the ipsilateral falks inferiorly around the ball. Uh, so that in itself, you wonder whether the vibrations of the drill can cause some loss on the opposite side, even though you preserved it. But even with that, we found that in both cases that the incidence of 
uh, of the best chance scenario was either severely hyposmic, that's the best chance scenario, and only a couple, two, three people, uh, or I think there was only one person in their group, none in our group, that had uh, uh, mildly hyposmia. Um, but the rest were all either anosmic or severely uh, hyposmic. Um, and you know that what that you gain, well, maybe there's a way with smell retraining in the, uh, in the uh, environment where you have like a gas leak or some uh, volatile vapors, maybe they can sense that. But our results have not been that, that great um, with unilateral cases. And not just anesthesia, we've done benign tumors that way too. Yeah, uh, uh, with all comers, actually, we have been successful on preserving so, some olfaction. So in 85% of taking all comers, not just the stesios, so the benign tumors and the whole thing, we have an 85% chance of, of preserving some olfaction. Uh, but uh, the great majority of those, I, I agree, 80% or so are going to be hyposmic. And, and we have about maybe 26 cases, 28 cases at this point. And there's um, Radiation, Rick, as you said, is going yeah, on. Exactly. That, that is the problem with the malignancies, especially when we when we favor proton for these patients. Uh, is I mentioned the, the extreme example that this patient that had completely normal olfaction, but I have a, a, another uh, three or four patients that were hyposmic and they lose it, lost it all too, and it doesn't recover. These patients are more than five years out; it just doesn't come back. What your case shows really nicely is that you can start off with an intention to do a particular operation and try and do it unilaterally, and then you only find out at surgery, in fact, the scanning and the endoscopy wasn't as accurate as you thought it was. And when you get in there, you end up having to sacrifice both. Yes, and, and the, 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 the most difficult case that I find is the one that you actually have negative frozen in the nose, and then you go intracranial and you have tumor in the olfactory bulb. So after spending a number of hours, you have to really convert it to, to a bilateral. And it, it's painful. I mean, it requires a lot of discipline to really follow what you need to do. And because at that point, uh, you have spent uh, quite a few hours. And I, ha I have to say that the unilateral resection is more tedious and is more difficult than the bilateral resection. Uh, so you may be at that point a little bit tired, and yet you have to go and complete the resection. And, the and even for reconstruction. Yeah. So in this case, how do you reconstruct the skull base? Okay. Micro? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, uh, I would use a, uh, a flap taken from the other side and I uh, put some fascia lata in. Um, so just do a two layered closure on something small like that. Right. I would do a version of what we do already with Aliderm, but on one side. Uh, it's a technique that's the same, similar inlay onlay type technique. Uh, if there is a flap, a septal flap, ipsilaterally that's cleared of margins uh, or even contralaterally, as Sean said then we would put that right over it and, and do a two layer type thing. But the real watertight closure is not the flap, it's the, it's the alloderm portion of it. And Mark, Rick? Yeah, so by definition on this one, I will have the nasoceptal flap available and, and before using it, just like it was mentioned, we do frozen section of both the, the part above the nasoceptal flap and of the nasoceptal flap itself so we have a two a, a double frozen section uh, so i will use an isoceptal flap and because the defect is much smaller on this one i don't go with the fascia i just go with the collagen matrix uh it's more or less in the same way that we use the fascia lata, kind of epidural subdural and then i would put the nasoceptal flap below great um to finish, Roy, may I ask you to prepare your case? Sure. Do you have it there by any chance? The, yeah. The... So while he prepared the case, they asked about the difference between protons or conventional radiotherapy. What is your opinion? Like you have experience with protons. 
Personally, I have no experience with protons in uh, these in neuroblastoma, so I'll, I'll pass over to the other guys. I pass over to Rick. We don't either. Okay. <laughs> so the, the difference with proton basically is that you don't have uh, exposure of, of from the radiation to adjacent structures. So you can, you can pinpoint um, better than conventional radiation uh, where that radiation is going to stop. So I, I don't, we, I cannot show you in, with just words how, how this works because, but the physics of the proton is such that when you give regular photons, the photons go through your target and continue exiting the body. So uh, what you have around the, the target gets certain amount of radiation and the, the photon exits uh, in the back and the back is gonna get certain amount of radiation. So what will happen in this area is that, of course, every adjacent area is important. You have the eyes, the optic nerves, the brain on the top. So the, the proton, because of the physics of the proton, the energy decays very quickly after hitting the target. So the amount of radiation that the adjacent tissue gets is much less. Now, that requires ex very good planning because otherwise it's a, it's a very potent type of bullet, and if you hit the adjacent areas, then you're gonna have the opposite effect. And we have seen that too. So it requires a very experienced proton therapist, a radiation oncologist to really use it. Uh, but the great advantage is not an oncologic advantage, it's really a side effects advantage. So you get less, uh, less radiation to things that are important. And that's why we consider it. And again, not all our patients go to Proton for because Proton is not available all around the world. Uh, they, they have to go to other places. We don't have one in Ohio yet, uh, not in Ohio, in, in Columbus. Uh, so we have to refer the patient and not everybody has the resources to move around. So most of our patients actually get IMRT. It's funny because we just got ours about a year ago, Rick, and we're still trying to figure out the protocol. Uh, you know, we've traditionally sent ours for like Cordomas and the posterior. Yeah. Outside yeah. Back, but not yeah. for these type of anterior. And, 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 and the complications from proton are intense. I mean, we have a, we mm -hmm. have a couple of patients that, one patient that actually died of proton therapy complications. He was cured of the tumor. And unfortunately, he got a lot of radiation to the brain parenchyma and ended up having severe dementia from that and, and he died unfortunately from the therapy. So Great. let's let's move to Roy. So is um you might want to you have control of it. Just kind of show everybody the scan first because it's a video. Um, can, can you share the screen your screen? I, I don't I'm in a different computer. I send you the video. Do you have the video? Oh um Because I, you know, didn't make it back from my office on time because of the two o'clock start time. I don't have it now because I have to upload it. So what we can do, we can take some question from audience instead. Because well, I think in a nutshell, it was just a video showing how we handle if there's, I know there was a concern for orbital invasion. And when you say orbital invasion, you can mean different things. Uh, obviously, if it's gross orbital invasion going through the periorbital into the actual muscle, that's one thing. And, and, and we agree that many of those, most of those are going to need probably an exoneration uh, procedure. Uh, fortunately, I haven't seen too many anesthesials do that. It does happen. Um, the, but there you can see periorbita involvement. And in those cases where it's the periorbita, where, as Rick said, there's abutment to the orbit, you take the lamina off. And as you're taking the lamina, you're examining that space between the periorbita and the bone. And you see that normally the periorbita is nice and white, and there's a nice, you elevate it right off without any problems. There's air and everything. Um, and, and in some cases, you'll see little areas of where it's sticky, where the bone sticks to the periorbit. In those cases, you have to suggest, it suggests you may have microscopic invasion of the periorbita. And in those cases, we, we just, without pushing on the eye, we just resect 
the periorbit of with micro scissors, uh, either in partially or in totally. And then when we reconstruct it with the alloderm, we make sure that we have an alloderm as it comes down and around to cover the upper part of the orbit. We extend that leaf down like a hammock to cover that area of reconstruction of the orbit. And then we put the normal, you know, flaps or gel foam and all that stuff on top of that. But there is a way that you can, and this was just a video illustrating that, how we, we resect the periorbit on showing some post-op on it. Sorry, Roy. The, uh, there's a question on, uh, uh, it says, is, in the third case, isn't it easier to use contralateral septal flap based on contralateral anterior ethmoid artery than using nasal septal flap, assuming the frozen sections are negative. Rick, that sounds like a question for you. Sorry, they were talking to me over here. I missed the, the premise. It's that last question, or oh, it's that second to the last question about the use of a contralateral, contralateral septal flap based on the anterior ethmoid artery. Yeah, so uh, to, to be able to do that, um, you have to preserve the entire septum. Yes, you, you, could, you could use that type of flap, the flip-flop or, or the, the, the swing flap from the contralateral side. Is it easier to use? I don't think so, because the problem with doing that type of flap is the anterior edge of the tumor. Uh, that convexity, as you as you move from anterior skull base to the back wall of the of the of the frontal sinus, is not reached by the flip flop flap in a very easy fashion. So I do prefer to use just a pedicle flap that allows me to to kind of rotated in a way uh, that goes to the skull base. The other one, uh, the, 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 it doesn't rotate. It just, just transfer itself. It, it, or at least it doesn't rotate anteriorly. It doesn't move anteriorly. Uh, so it rotates only one axis. Uh, so unless you take the absolutely almost complete septum, you may not reach that area over there. So I prefer to use the nasal septal flap, but there, there will be cases that are more toward the middle, uh, that they don't go so anterior that, yeah, you can, you can use that. As far as the Christagalli and unilateral resection, I already mentioned earlier, I do drill it down a little bit. Some people don't. I tend to take all the bone in that upper part of the septum uh, and adjacent Christagalli as I'm lifting the falks with the tumor and resecting unilaterally. But again, others don't. Um, yeah, I, faction even worse. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, and uh, I know that you you need to do it because the way of that you do the reconstruction, right? You're gonna use the Alamax epidurally, uh, but I just use the nasoceptal flap below, so I, I don't need to remove the chrysogallus. So I just leave it alone. On oncologically, it's really one way or the other. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's more for the reconstructive part. talked about proton. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions. Something about do you start radiotherapy if the flap is still not fully epithelialized? Well, if it's a flap, it's fully epithelialized immediately. It's just vascular. I guess I mean vascularized. Yeah, I mean, I started within five to six weeks and Rick said the same thing. In case of neck, there's one about neck metastasis. How do we deal with it? I, if I have any neck metastasis, they get a full neck dissection. I mean, zone levels one through five, basically. I, I take it all out, and then we follow up with, with chemo radiation in those cases. You do bilateral? No, I, I do, I do the, the side that is positive, and the other side is treated with radiation, prophylactic radiation. I don't do the bilateral. Um, I've, had, 
I've had situations where I've staged the neck dissection, not exactly what Rick said. So, so he, I, that, that's a good point, Roy. I do not do the neck dissection at the same time. I actually stage it. Uh, and he said, it probably is just theoretical, but in my head, I, I fear that I have a, a, a big anterior skull base resection with a big defect. And then I go the neck and do a neck dissection and the jugular vein clots, and then you have more brain swelling and more brain herniation. So I actually stage it, two, I give it at least two weeks in between. So I do the resection of the tumor, wait until I know it's healed, and then I go and do the neck dissection. And we would do the same here as well, and, uh, and, and chemotherapy, radiotherapy to the whole surgical field, opposite neck as well. There's a question about the extent of uh, is that ND nodal disease in terms of elective and therapeutic. I think we covered that. Mm. Yeah. And then retropharyngeal lymph nodes. I don't do much for that. Yeah, unfortunately, I have attempted to, to take those out several times and with, with very unfulfilling results. Is, um, I'm always very dissatisfied. I, Sorry, I, Roy, I have bad bad connection, and uh, I can't download the video. So I thought uh, that you no problem. So Shane, uh, micro micro, please. Thank you. I was just going to say that's um, perfect timing. Just uh, just gone eight o'clock UK time. Uh, nine o'clock Barcelona time and uh, sometime mid afternoon for you guys. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Listen, can I just thank uh, all the panelists and Assam uh, for what has been a fantastic, uh, really concentrated uh, session on anesthesia and neuroblastoma. It's not an hour, often you get an hour to talk about these things, and I think we've covered a huge amount there. So, really uh, grateful to you guys uh, for uh, your contributions and for taking the time to, um, to do this. Thanks also to the ER ERS for uh, uh, allowing us to run these uh, webinars. And can I just remind everybody that uh, our next webinar is going to be on the uh, 9th of November. Uh, details will come out of that by email uh, short, shortly. So it just remains uh, once more to thank everybody. Have a nice evening. And uh, we've had a good number of participants this evening, uh, well into uh, triple figures. And that's pretty good for a Friday evening. We've kept people out of the bars and in front of their uh, screen. So <laughs> thanks very much, guys. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.